Hey everybody, welcome to your Postgres video. My name is Caleb and this video is going to give you everything you need to get started with the Postgres database. This is a great database to get started building applications. It's going to give you the ability to use this in a production environment without having to pay money. It's all open source. And overall, getting started with Postgres is very easy. You can read more about Postgres at their website, postgresql.org, and you can see how is Postgres licensed. There's no fee even for use in commercial software products. So you can start building your application with Postgres, and then if you decide to launch it and you're actually making some money, you don't then have to go pay a bunch of money for permission to use the database in a commercial setting. So to get started, go to the download page for Postgres, and there's going to be a bunch of different operating systems. I'm on a Mac, and I'm actually going to install Postgres with Homebrew. So you can get this at brew.sh, and then use this command to install Homebrew in the terminal, and then you can very easily install different software. So I'm going to launch the terminal. So I just got done installing brew, and then I'm going to run these two commands to add it to my path. So I'll copy this one here enter, and then this one here. And now we should be able to say brew install PostgreSQL. That should install everything we need to start working with Postgres from the terminal. We'll also take a look at running files, which should be a little bit easier for working with larger SQL statements. Now it looks like this installed Postgres 14. There actually is a newer version, so you can say brew install Postgres 15 with the at sign here. And then this is the command with homebrew to start Postgres. So brew services start Postgres at 15. So we'll say brew services start Postgres QL 15. And this will start the service. Now, how do we actually use it? I'm gonna go full screen here. Now to run this, we're going to say PSQL, and then we'll pass a few additional flags. The first one being the host, which is going to be localhost, and then the database is going to be Postgres. So this is how you start the interactive session. So you can start executing SQL commands to create databases and insert data. So very basic example, create database forum, and this will create the database. So you actually have to create a database. It's not like if you watched my SQL Lite video, where once you start the interactive session, you're already within a database. In Postgres, you're going to have the ability to have multiple databases here. Now we're only going to be working with one in this video, but you could use multiple if you needed to organize things a certain way. Next command I wanted to show you is a backslash command, and this will allow you to do special things that are not to be interpreted as SQL, but rather ways to talk to the Postgres database, such as con info, which will give you the connection info. You are connected to database Postgres as user code breakthrough. That's my uh, laptop name on host localhost and then at port 5432. So if you wanted to connect to this from a graphical user interface, then you could use all of this information to fill that in. So a popular GUI example would be PG admin. We're not gonna cover that in this video, but you could definitely give that a shot. Now, how do you issue a clear command? I like to know that just because as I make these videos, I don't like there to be like tons of junk. You just use a backslash exclamation mark clear. Whatever command you put here will be interpreted as a terminal command. So that will clear the screen. Alternatively, you could say ls. Now, if you're on Windows, it might be slightly different, but you would just use cls to clear the screen. All right, cool. So let's go back to a clear screen and learn some of the basics. Let's go through an example of creating a table. We'll do this from within the terminal, and then we'll go to a file, which will show you how much easier it is to work within a file. But just to get some experience here, we will say create table and by convention, any keywords are uppercase with the exception of data types. And then any identifiers are lowercase. So create table users and you'll open a parentheses and we'll identify what columns we want in here. So an example would be user ID, which would be of type int. And the way you create a primary key in Postgres is you say generated always as identity primary key. Pretty verbose, but you'll get used to it and you'll be able to type that in no time. Next up, we will have any columns. So we'll go down to the next line. We can say username and we can make this of type varchar and then give a limit of say 50 characters. You can say not and all to make it required and then unique to say that nobody can share usernames. Yours has to be unique, comma. And then let's create another column for email, which will say varchar255 not in all unique. Then we won't put a comma here, go down to the next line, close the parentheses, and then a semicolon. This will say create table, and that means it's successful. 
and you can say backslash dt to see the relations or tables that exist. And you can see there's one of type table and it's called users. Now here I am from within Visual Studio Code, my editor of choice. And what we can do is we can create a new text file and we'll save this, just whatever you want to call it, db.sql. Save. And we can take that command. So I'm going to take all this, copy it. Now I might need to change it just a little bit. Actually, what I could do is just use the up arrow and it will have it without all those prompts on the left. And paste this. So I'm going to show you how you can run a file now. So we'll open a new terminal here so we can just do it all within. And we will start a session here to interact with our database. So we'll say psql dash h for host localhost dash d for database and that was called postgres and this should start our session and then we can say backslash i and then the name of the file which is in the same directory db.sql and it looks like i just didn't complete the command so it should look like this here so we can just run it again and it says relation users already exist. So this is the response we expected since we already created that table. Now you could say if not exists and that will work as well. And it just says skipping create table. Now I want to talk about altering a database. I'm just going to comment this out so we don't have this response every time we run it. And then what we'll do is we'll say alter table, which is how we can change the structure of a table, the name. So alter table users, and we can say add column. We could call this name, and this could be varchar 30, not null, but I won't make it unique. And in a semicolon and then run, and it says alter table, which means it should be successful. And you should be able to say backslash D and then the name of the table, in this case users to see the details. And you can see we now have name with that type. So we've talked about how to create tables and alter them. Now let's talk about how we can delete them, which we actually use the drop command. So we could say drop table users. This is generally pretty dangerous. So don't run this unless you're hundred percent sure you're right. We'll run and we get drop table. So now we should not see that table. So when we say backslash D users did not find any relation named users. So that's how you delete tables. I'm going to actually recreate it though. So I'm going to uncomment this briefly and run this file again and then comment that back out. So that's kind of an overview of data definition language, which talks about how we define our data structure. Now I want to talk about data manipulation language, which talks about how we insert data, get that data back out, update the data and delete data. So to begin, we can retrieve data with select everything from users. This is a pretty simple command that will retrieve all the columns, which is currently empty, so we get zero rows. So now we need to learn how to insert data, but we'll continue to use this to see it. So I'll push that down. We'll say insert into users, and then inside of parentheses here, you're going to put what columns you want to insert into. So the ID is going to be automatic, and then anything with the default value is optional, and anything that is not, not null or optional you do not have to put here so let's just put the bare minimum here which is going to be the username and the email our current table does not have this here um, the name so let me actually run that real quick i'll comment this out so that way we can just have the full table so if we take a look at the table we have username email and name all right so far so good i'm going to comment that back out and now we will insert into this table and we're going to insert into the username and email. And then we'll say values and then put what we want to put in. I'll often put this down on the next line, but you can do it all on a single line. So I'll usually do it like this. And then we'll say something like username is calcur, email is calcur at email.com. Something like that. Now the name is optional actually it does say not null here. So we need to have that. So the name is going to be Caleb Curry. I don't know why I thought it was optional. I think I was just confusing it with the unique constraints, which I only have on email and username, but it is required. So we'll need to put all three of these. So username, email, 
and a name. And then I'll uncomment this and we should be able to execute both of these as long as each one ends in a semicolon. We should be good to go. So backslash i db.sql, we insert and then we get back the data and there you go. Now let's talk about how we can update data. So I'm going to comment that out and I will say update then the name of the table. So users set name to some value We'll just say John Smith. And then you'll usually want to have a where here to specify which rows we want to update. So we could say where ID is one. So you can see from the select, we have ID one. So we can be very specific about which row we want to update. So we don't just update everybody to John Smith. That's another common mistake you don't want to make. Always make sure you have a where clause. So let's run. And it looks like we just need to specify user underscore ID. And now, we get John Smith for the name. Delete is going to look pretty similar, so I'm going to copy this and it's going to look like this. Delete users, remove the set, and then just have the where, and that'll say which rows you want to delete. And one other thing is we need the from keyword, and we run, and you can see it deleted that data. All right, cool, so that is the basics of data manipulation language. Now I want to talk about relationships. A relationship is when you define a column that references another column, and this forces every value in that column to exist in that other column that we're referencing. So it makes probably more sense if we give a concrete example. Say we're creating a forum and we have posts. Well, these posts can be created by a user, so we need to reference back to that user ID. So we would create a foreign key to do this. We'll go over this briefly, but there's a lot more you can study on this. I have a whole eight hour video on database design if you want all the juicy details. So to do this, we're going to create table posts, open the parentheses, and the first thing we'll have is a post ID, which will be generated always as identity primary key. Then we'll have a user ID, which will be of type int. This will need to match the type of the original table. So you can see right here, it's defined as an int, but we don't need to have all this. It's not going to be a primary key. Instead, we'll say references and then the table name, users, and then in parentheses, the column, user ID. And then we'll just have a title, which will be text, not null, and then body, text, not null. Text is another data type like varchar, but it's not going to artificially limit the size. So just showing you that as another option. All right, let's end this in a semicolon. See if we can get this to work. I forgot the type here, so I'll define that as an int. Run, and we get to create table. So we created the table successfully, and now we should be able to say backslash dt to see the two tables. And we can say backslash d users. That should look exactly the same. It does add a referenced by showing that this is being referenced by another table, but the table structure for the user stays the same. The parent table doesn't need to understand that it's being referenced. The foreign key, which is defined in the child table, which you can see with backslash D posts is right here. This foreign key constraint is going to reference the user's table. You don't have to create an ID column or anything like that in the parent table the one that's being referenced. Now, in order to create a post, we must first have a user because we need to reference a user when we create a post. So let's go up here and reinsert this user that we deleted. So we'll run this and we have a successful insert. So we should be able to see that. Select everything from users and we can see that data and it's going to have the user ID too. So when we create a post, we will use that ID. So it's going to look like this insert into posts values and then I'll provide the columns user ID title body and then the values we're gonna have two then we'll have the title so this is a post title and then the body this is more information thanks for reading and then we'll actually insert a few values so I'll put a comma here and then we can put another set of parentheses so let's say he makes another post this is a second post. This is the post body. And then we can end the whole thing in a semicolon. 
and we run and we get insert zero two, so two rows were inserted. And now let's select everything from posts and I'm going to comment out this section here. Run and you can see those two rows. Now it doesn't show the actual user information, it just shows the user ID. So to fix this, we need to learn about joins. So to create a join, we will say select everything from posts, and I'm gonna keep this basic one, but I'll just comment it out so it'll look like that. Select everything from posts. Then you'll say inner join, and then the other table, users, on, and then make some equality, specifically the posts.user ID being equal to the users dot user ID. So we run this and now we get a bunch more information. It looks exactly the same for these first four columns, but then we get all of the user information for user ID too. So we can use this to basically select what we want. For example, we could get the title and the username. Now when we run this, we just get the username instead of some random ID because when you're working with tons of rows, you're not gonna know what ID 6000 is, right? So this will allow us to replace that with the username. And because this is complicated, you might see this split up across multiple lines, something like this. And then you could also make this into a view. That way you can access it very easily. So to do that, you could say create view, post info, and then you say as, and then I'll just indent these three lines. Then down here, you can just say, select everything from post info, almost as if it's another table. It's like a virtual table, a view into the data where you specify what you want that data to look like. So that way you don't have to craft this join every single time, you just have to create it once in the view. And then after that, you can no longer create the view and just use it it's almost like another table. So anytime we want to get the title and username, we can just select everything from post info. If we happen to create another post, let me just try this with another example. I don't think these are unique, so I could just probably run this as is. You can see now we have four posts. So the view will update with new data, but the structure, the way the view looks, stays the same. Whoa, what is that on my screen? Do you guys see that? So that is the basics of Postgres. My goal is to get you started as quickly as possible and give you that foundation, not to teach you everything you need to know. Now you should at least be proficient creating basic tables and joins, and you've only probably spent, you know, 20, 30 minutes learning this material. So hopefully this gave you what you needed and stay tuned for upcoming videos. If you want a follow-up video on how to work with Postgres from code, then definitely let me know in the comments section. Or if there are certain things you want to learn more about, let me know. I'll look into making videos on those topics. Thank you. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace out.